Bienvenidos. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today's, um, for today's discussion. The program today will tackle the history of Utah before statehood, when it was Mexican territory, focusing on the significance of the history and what it means to Utah and to us as a community. Before we get started with today's program, I want to acknowledge the tribe's ancestral homeland that we are on, Dene, Goshute, Paiute, Shoshone, and Ute tribes. Next, I would like to introduce and welcome Consul Jose Borjón. Consul Jose Borjón has served as head consul for Mexico for Utah and Western Wyoming since June 16, 2017. He is a career Mexican diplomat with the rank of minister and has been representing his country, its interest, and its people abroad for the last 20 years. Before arriving to Utah, he worked in the Mexico City offices of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Protocol Division, where he contributed to the institutional events offered by the presidency to foreign dignitaries. He was also Deputy Director General in the Southern Border in the Latin America and Caribbean Division, responsible for the follow-up and the bilateral relations with Guatemala and Belize. Previously, he was Senior Advisor for the Under Secretary of Latin America and the Caribbean. He has also served in the Mexican Embassy in Washington, D.C., the General Consulate of Mexico in Houston, and the Embassy of Mexico in Korea. He holds a degree in international relations from UNAM, a Mex master's degree in diplomatic studies from the Diplomatic Academy of Mexico, and an MA in European studies from Ortega and Gasset Institute. He's joined in Utah by his wife and three girls. Welcome, Consul Bo uh, Jose Borjón. Thank you, Dr. Leticia Alvarez. What a pleasure and, and what a great opportunity for me to um, join this wonderful panel on when Utah was Mexico. And I'm really are looking forward to the next speakers who have uh, gone into very different aspects of, of this important uh, chapter of the history of, of Utah. But what I'd like to do is um, give with um, a view of how Mexico is also celebrating a, a series of uh, very important dates which have relevance to our discussion. And, and this is the objective uh, so that from my perspective as, as a Mexican government official, I can tell you what is going on in Mexico and why I believe it's important for today's discussion. 2021 uh, for us uh, in Mexico is a year for uh, remembering and uh, very important celebrations that have the opportunity of um, starting a process of reconciliation. And I think that is relevant for our discussion. And that's what I would like very briefly to share with you. There are specific critical dates in our history that are coinciding somewhere in 2021. And, and that's very important. And I think Utah has a place in this uh, recon, um, activities. Let me go to the first one uh, is the 700 years of the foundation of the city of Tenochtitlan, which um, there are a lot of uh, versions and interpretations, uh, but at least from for the perspective of a celebration, we're beginning to uh, see 2021 as, as this uh, date of uh, celebrating those 700 years, which really uh, signaled the ending of the pilgrimage by the Mexica of one of the seven Nahuatl tribes that left Aztlán. And with this, um, by finding their uh, site in the valley of, of where Mexico City is today, began a civilization and a very important empire. So uh, this has, uh, is an opportunity. And the next big date, of celebration is the 500 years of the fall of the great Tenochtitlan with the uh, Spanish invasion. And pretty much in August 13, 1521, uh, after being besieged, the city falls uh, to the uh, conquistadores of Hernán Cortés and their uh, allies of indigenous uh, city uh, that were um, adversaries 
of the uh, Aztecs. So that's a, a very important date that is also part of our process of different celebrations that we're having throughout this year. And the third and most uh, relevant is the 200 years of the conclusion of our Mexican independence. So although we celebrate uh, September 16th of 1810 as the day of uh, our independence when uh, Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla gave his cry for um, beginning the process of independing ourselves from Spain. It was really a, a process that would take uh, almost uh, 10, 11 years until 1821, when really uh, the, the military uh, leader, Agustin de Turbide, uh, saw the, the opportunity of maintaining a, a series of um, prerogatives and, and aligning himself with the uh, what was left of the Mexican rebellion with Vicente Guerrero. So, a very important series of dates. But the important thing for our discussion is that when Mexico became independent of Spain and its territory, well, obviously Utah also became independent because of the territories of Southwest US, California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona. Uh, well, those were part of, of the realm of, of the new uh, Spain and, and, and the new Mexican country. So what does this make? This is, as, as I said, an opportunity, the way we're seeing it in Mexico in, in this celebration of this historical landmarks and, and part of our history, an opportunity for reconciliation. Um, really taking advantage of these dates for us as, as a people, a country to remember, make uh, memories that will rebuild and uh, represent our identities. And this is a process that is not easy because to do that, we need to acknowledge a series of different and traumatic actions for uh, this reconciliation to take effect. Let me give you an example of what is being done in Mexico. For example, uh, this year there's a planning of a specific day when the government of Mexico will uh, ask forgiveness for the way it treated uh, a group of, like the Mayans, the Yaquis, even the Chinese uh, for the persecution in, in different times of our history. So this is an important process. Many countries have gone through it of uh, recognizing this history to reach uh, this reconciliation. As a, and it, it could be a, an international opportunity. Our president has invited both Spain and the Vatican as, as the head of the Catholic Church to join this reconciliation by offering an apology to the native peoples in Mexico for these abuses and atrocities during the period of the Spanish conquest and its colonial rule. Uh, it has not been uh, accepted, uh, this uh, proposal, but I believe just you know putting this idea forward has an intention of really achieving a shared narrative between us and, and, and those who had a, a, a specific play and role in our history and colonial to reach to a new stage uh, through agreement without confrontation and, and this way also um, healing, uh, which is also important in, in the ethos of a, a nation. So I believe this has an uh, uh, idea, uh, a lot of value because of, of what is what we're looking for. What does this represent for Utah, this uh, uh, dates and, and celebrations I'm sharing with you from Mexico? Well, I think it's important because uh, it, we need to, as, as I would say, acknowledge those whose land, uh, both uh, in this area and Mexico, were before us. And uh, I would want to put into your attention the, the importance, for example, of the Uto Azteca and language family, how it is really uh, geographically, you will find uh, this richness of linguistic um, expressions. And, and this way, uh, you know, there are many bridges that, that are putting us together besides the specific historic one. And of course, there were American Indians here in Utah and during, before the Mormon settlement. And more importantly, in the second case, when Mexico, as I said, achieved its independence, 
Well, this Utah territory was also part of Mexico, but it was also very active, uh, as, as we uh, know, in, um, in trade. And that's the relevance, for example, of the Spanish Trail connecting Santa Fe to Los Angeles. And those were Mexicans and some foreigners also as well, interacting uh, with uh, American Indians. And, and, and that was a very dynamic part so uh, what I would like to put out there for your consideration and, and the discussion uh, um, hearing is that we need to recover. And when I say we, we is uh, those Mexicans, Mexican-Americans, a living memory of our existence in this territory known as Utah. Where are our symbols, our spaces, uh, and where are them? You know, and, and the work that has already been done by many here and who, who will speak after me, and I'm really honored to be joining them, is important. And we must continue this uh, work for making this collection of our memories, which are stories of Mexicans, Mexican American and Hispanics in Utah, both visible and practical. So um, I think that is my main interest and, and what I look forward to to hearing from all of you because this is a growing and diverse state and we must continue reconstructing uh, from these collective experiences including the Mexican presence in the state uh, through its history of what uh, Utah is today and that's uh, I think very important so why would I'm interested is that we Mexicans want to be part of the history and memory of Utah. And as we discuss um, this, uh, this is an opportunity for us to really develop. And I look forward working with all of you and, and throughout this year, as we commemorate this important dates for us, that we can find those bridges with this process in Utah. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I look forward uh, to hearing the next speakers and a, a very rich discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Consul Borjon. Thank you for your insights and how they relate to our discussion today and for giving a little bit of the history of Utah before it became a state. Um, you might want to turn off your camera. There we go. Um, before it became a state and the significance of the history um, currently and historically um, and what it means to us as a community in the Southwest today and in Utah. In the 1840s, President James Polk was eager to acquire more territory, and he believed in manifest destiny, the idea that the U.S. was destined and had the duty to expand westward on the North American um, continent. Very controversial from other perspectives, of course. And I think that's something that Consul um, Borjón pointed to, is the mixing of different stories and histories um, Mexico and the United States tend to remember their 1847 conflict and the Treaty of Guadalupe very differently. More than 500,000 square miles of land became California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and parts of Colorado and Wyoming became U.S. property. To this day, generally speaking, Mexicans still consider the land unjustly stolen. On the one hand, many U.S. citizens, on the other hand, many U.S. citizens might claim that the land was righteously obtained. As we go through today's program, I ask that you take note of the information that you might already be privy to, as well as take note of the new information and how you could shift your discourses about history. In particular, for educators, I want to encourage you to consider what knowledge you already have and what knowledge you're missing as well as what history is not being included in your classrooms that may inadvertently make some students' histories invisible and excluded. I want to start our discussion with a short excerpt from a podcast series, which is sponsored by the nonprofit Artes de Mexico in Utah. You'll be hearing different perspectives about the Mexican US history. The podcast developed out of a, um, out of a class about Mexican art and history that Fanny Blauer and Susan Vogel teach to older adults. Fanny, who grew up in Mexico, says that her students get uncomfortable when the subject of the Mexican-American War comes up. She says in Mexico, they have a different name for it, American Invasion. Let's take a listen to a short excerpt from the podcast about the Mexican War. 
So I can share my experience with this. Um, so I grew up in California. Here's Luis Lopez. Uh, and at school, we learned the Mexican-American War, right? I think we spent like two days on it, if that. I come home and say, hey, Dad, today I got to learn about the Mexican-American War. He goes, what Mexican-American War? <laughs> I say, yeah, you know, when I, to me, it's like you know, mutual combat, right, between two adversaries over some kind of dispute. I said, uh, no, Mexico was basically already weak, beat up, so trying to recover, and they just came in and took it, right? And so that got a completely different narrative at home. Um, at the time, I was like, huh, interesting. I, I, w I wasn't quite sure where, you know, where I kind of fell. You know, do I agree more with invasion with that terminology? Do I agree more with Mexican-American War? Um, but, yeah, at the age of 13, I, 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 real quick, I realized that what the schools in the United States were teaching, at least in that state, wasn't necessarily the, the whole truth, right? And so, uh, yeah, as a, as a Chicano, that definitely contributed to some feelings later on about, well, now I'm in this space, right? I have no control over what happened, but um, there is that sense of, of nativeness to this land, right? Like, being, being Mexicano as well, uh, history lets me know that we were here prior to these disputes, and so that definitely made another connection for me. This is Susan Vogel. So um, I grew up with this idea, you know, just that we all, our relatives, our ancestors came west for the great opportunities and to build our country and grew up singing the song about the U.S. from sea to shining sea right. and just very proud of, of this heritage of the United States. Um, never, you know, we definitely learned that that um, during this expansion there were some terrible things done regarding Native Americans. But um, other than that, it was more just, you know, proud of, of this pioneer heritage and this, um, the values of, of expanding this country and building it and the California gold rush and all the things that built the, the country we have now. Let's get back to the art. If you could name only one image that most profoundly shaped American cultural identity during the late 1800s, what would it be? It might be this one. It's pretty commonly found in American history textbooks. It's called American Progress. It was painted in 1872 by John Gast. It looks huge. And when I first looked at that, this, I thought, it must be like a mural. It's so powerful. In fact, it's small. It's only 12 inches by 16 inches. But it's been reproduced many times. It was commissioned by a publisher of a fashionable Western travel guide and pr reproduced extensively in magazines and as a poster. It's often called the Manifest Destiny image. It's a rectangular painting of an imagined landscape of the American West. There's movement in this painting from right to left, mainly because the main subject of the painting here is this blonde, white-skinned, scantily clad, angelic image floating through the air towards from the light on the right to the darkness on the left. This angelic figure lady is holding a book in her right hand. And on the left hand, she's trailing behind her wires. So this would be telegraph wires, or it could be Google Fiber, I don't know. It represents <laughs> the expansion of technology, I think. Below this floating woman, railroad tracks are being laid. Horse-drawn stagecoaches are driving forward, and white European people are in the forefront, advancing westward towards the left side, which is the dark and cloudy and foreboding western frontier. And on the edge, we see Indians and buffalo and other wild animals being driven out. I think this also is a very symbolic of the lens in which history is written, uh, for me personally. Uh, text uh, throughout schools, throughout the different curriculums, kind of portrays history in the same way. And we see it uh, from elementary all the way up to high school, um, where settlers are, are kind of seen as, as heroes and doing the work of God. Um, and they downplay uh, the, the atrocities that happened to native peoples. And so uh, with this image, this woman looking angelic, heavenly, I mean, she doesn't look uh, menacing or, or, or aggressive. I mean, she's just gracefully kind of gliding over, over these, uh, 
people down here, kind of protecting them. And, and it almost seems like naturally the Native Americans and these animals are kind of, you know, on their own, just kind of going away, getting out of the way. And, and that's not really how things went down. Whenever I stand under the rotunda of the Utah State Capitol and look up, I see images that tell stories not unlike John Gast's American Progress. These large public murals tell the state's official narrative about this place. Most of the mural panels depict an industrious group of pioneers, their skin as white as mine, intrepidly building a new home out of the wilderness. In one panel, a group of men are planting an American flag atop Ensign Peak. But what interests me most is a single panel showing the backs of four brown-skinned, Mexican-looking men wearing sombreros with a donkey. Next to them stands two Spanish missionaries, and next to them, a solitary Native American man, standing almost pushed out of the frame. Each of these men are lumped into the same panel, even though they inhabited this land at completely different times. They're all looking out across the horizon towards Utah Lake. I wonder what they're thinking. I wonder what stories they would tell about this place. I wonder if they saw those white pioneers as illegal immigrants coming into Mexico. Excellent. Great questions posed. And I too wonder if they saw white pioneers as undocumented immigrants coming into Mexico. The panel in the rotunda highlighted in the podcast is likely depicting the Dominguez and Escalante expedition as they had arrived to Utah Lake. At the time, it was known as Lago de Tampinovos. Although the Valley of the Great Salt Lake was claimed by Mexico and inhabited by natives, church leaders decided to establish new settlement here and used it as a stage for more colonization. Were they viewed as the colonizers or undocumented immigrants? As we move forward to our program, let's consider whose perspectives are we hearing from? Whose histories are we validating and why? Whose histories are we erasing and why? And to what end? What are the complexities of the history of Utah belonging to Mexico? Who's missing? Who inhabited this land prior to the colonization by Spain and Mexico? What are their histories? And are they being included? I hope these questions spark curiosity about expanding our individual knowledge base. And for educators, I hope you begin to ask new questions about your own perspectives and curriculum decisions. And for young people joining us, I ask that you begin to ask questions about the history that you're being taught in school. Point out to your teachers who's being excluded and why is, are you being included in the history that you're being taught? Also be aware of the language that is used throughout our discussion. This webinar was set up with the intention of highlighting that Utah was Mexico, but this fact and complex history doesn't get necessary, the necessary attention in our public school curriculum. Why is that? What can teachers do to address this history with nuance and compassion? Given this context, I want to introduce our first presenter, Sherman Fleek. Sherman Fleek, retired from the U.S. Army in 2002 after a 25-year career as Lieutenant Colonel. He served as an aviator special forces officer and enlisted armor crewman, ending his career as chief historian of the National Guard Bureau. Lieutenant Colonel is a native of Layton, Utah. He holds a BA in English from Brigham Young University and a master's, Master of Art degree in American history from University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. As a historian, he has been more than, he has more than 30 uh, published articles on military frontier, army, Mexican war and civil war history in national periodical and historical journals. In 2006, his first book, History May Be Searched in Vain, a military history of the Mormon battalion is award-winning. He served from 2002 to 2005 as a historian for, the, for a Civil War Preservation Foundation, telling the Civil War story in the Shenandoah Valley. In 2005, the U.S. Army appointed Mr. Fleet as a historian to record 
and to write the Army's official history of the reconstruction efforts in Iraq, then served in Iraq in 2006. In May 2007, he became the first ever historian for the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. In 2009, he was appointed the command historian for the United States Military Academy West Point in New York. And since 2013, Fleek has taught military history to cadets at West Point and has taught a graduate history course to army officers affiliated with Columbia University's Teachers College. Welcome, Lieutenant Colonel Sherman Fleek. Dr. Alvarez, thank you so much for that. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you tonight. Yes, I am from Utah. I grew up in Layton, born at Hill Air Force Base. And when I got this position, so I'm just gonna tell you right now, with soldiers, I always say, okay, joke's coming up, so be prepared for it, okay? So here's, here's my joke, which actually happened. So when I was appointed or received the position about this time 12 years ago, I called one of my sisters and I said, hey, I'm gonna be the historian at West Point. And she said, oh, you're coming home to Utah? And I said, no, the other West Point. And she said, what other West Point? So I uh, hate to denigrate my sister a little bit. I didn't tell you which one. So it is an honor to be here. Um, what I wanna talk about tonight is the unique qualities of the Mormon battalion. So physically, the battalion as a unit never entered Utah territory or the state of what is, what is Utah today, but was part of the Mexican War. And it has some very unique, uh, very unique features that um, a lot of historians, military historians have not um, touched on. And so it's always a, a process of education as we're doing tonight. It starts with James K. Polk and and uh, Jesse Little, a Latter-day Saint, who was asked by Brigham Young, uh, the leader of the church at that time, 1846. The saints, a good share of them were on the move, crossing from Nauvoo, heading to what became future Utah. They really, in a way, didn't know where they were gonna end up, in the Great Basin or in California. And uh, Jesse Little's mission was to obtain some support from the government to help finance the move. Eventually, he was involved with a decision to create a volunteer battalion of about 500 men that would be mustered into federal service and serve in the war in Mexico. Uh, eventually, um, Stephen Watts Carney, Colonel, later Brigadier General, commander of the 1st Dragoons, uh, which is a mounted unit horseback, uh, one of the great frontier officers of that era, um, his mission was to first go into New Mexico, um, the state of part of Mexico proper, and then the mission was changed to go all the way to California. So the battalion was uh, one of the only infantry or foot soldier units in the Army of the West. And so <clears throat> here is a president of the United States very involved with uh, orchestrating the, the calling up of uh, a battalion. Now we have regiments, brigades, then eventually divisions that served in, um, in the Mexican War. And so real quick, from the Constitution, there's two forms of military in our nation. The regular army and the Navy, and then the militia. The militia of the colonies during the revolution, militia of the states. In peacetime, they're under the control of the governors. During wartime, they can be uh, called up um, to serve in a federal capacity. Um, <clears throat> but in the War of 1812, 400,000 odd militiamen from various, various states refused to cross over the border in Canada to fight against the Canadians and British. So that was the militia called the enrolled militia where it was just the, the men from age 18 to 45 were supposed to serve in the military if there was a demand, if there was a need, if there was an insurrection. And the, and the constitution talks about militia to put down insurrections and um, local emergencies and so on. 
But then uh, 1830s, 1840s, and the Nauvoo Legion was part of this, there came an idea of a volunteer. So the term volunteer, volunteer militia, is very important. So if the state governors, as in Mexican War, 1846, were asked to have a levy of two regiments of infantry, a regiment of cavalry, um, uh, some artillery companies or regiments, then that was requisitioned from the states to go fight in a war. Happened in the Civil War, happened in the Spanish-American War. So then eventually the volunteers were allowed because they're volunteering and even though they have state affiliation, they're not really under the governor during that service and therefore they can be an expeditionary force. As la late as 1916, when the uh, Pancho Villa crossed over into, Me into New Mexico, raided there, killed some Americans and so on, there was guardsmen, 120,000 guardsmen called out on the border, even from Connecticut all the way down to Texas and New Mexico, but they, were, they did not cross the border, only the regular army troops did. So in 1916, an important act was made to make um, the National Guard, what we have today, an expeditionary force. The next year, 1917, we go to war against Germany. So volunteers is important. Everyone, all the men that served in the Mormon battalion were volunteers. And when James Allen, captain, West Point class, 1829, when he arrived under orders to muster in this battalion, he met with resistance. Many of the saints were very embittered about what happened in Missouri and Ohio and Illinois. Some of them didn't want to serve. John Taylor, who later became President of the United States, wrote, I have myself felt swearing mad at the government for the treatment we have received at the hands of those in authority. Hosea Stout wrote, we were all very indignant at this requisition and only looked upon it as a plot laid to bring trouble on us as a people. They didn't trust the federal government, but Brigham Young, even before he met Captain Allen, he told the saints that they needed to go forth. He wrote, to, this is recorded the night before he met um, Captain Allen in Council Bluffs, Iowa. I wish them, the saints, to make a distinction between this action by the general government and our former op oppressions in Missouri and Illinois. Suppose we are admitted into the union as a state and the government did not call on us we would feel ourselves neglected. Let the Mormons be the first to set their feet on the soil of California. This is the first offer we have ever had from the government to benefit us. So without Brigham Young's help, this wouldn't happen. In the militia, when a unit is called up or volunteers form, they go to a political leader, the governor, the legislatures, but here, Captain Allen went to a church leader, which provides the thought here. The Mormon battalion is the only religious unit we've had in American military history. I'll say that again. It's the only religious unit we've ever had. We've had ethnic units, African Americans, Navajo code talkers. We had uh, Native American units of uh, scouts and so on. We had the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, World War II, all Japanese Americans, but they weren't religious, they were ethnic. And here, even the title, Mormon, is a, is a religious term. And once they're mustered in for one year, a unit, a militia unit that becomes volunteer is, they, they elect their officers. And so as captains and as the colonel of the regiment and so on, they're elected. In the Mormon battalion, Brigham Young called them. And he decided who was going to be the five captains and the five first lieutenants and the 10 second lieutenants and all the NCOs. So it was a calling. They eventually received about $21,000 for their uniform allowance and their first few months of pay at Fort Leavenworth when they arrived there on the 1st of August. Of that 21,000, 5,000 went back to the church to help with the Exodus West. So Brigham Young saw the battalion 
as uh, a saving principle and so on. So they started the march and uh, Willie, I don't know if you can pop up that um, um, map I have, I presented to you, I gave to you, but um, <clears throat> without Brigham Young's um, assistance, the Mormon battalion uh, would not have happened. They never fought in any battle. So they marched to Santa Fe and uh, en route, um, they learned that Captain Allen, who had been promoted from Captain Lieutenant Colonel in the volunteers, he still retained his rank as a captain and regulars, had died at Fort Leavenworth. So there was a chain of command, another West, West Pointer took over. So there were four regular army officers that attend, that served with the battalion, and all four of them graduated from West Point, where I work. And so, and so family detachments. What's unique about the battalion is there were, and I'll use the term uh, dependents. There were a number of women, a number of children that went along with the battalion. This is not perfectly unique to military history. You've always had, and the term they've used in the past, and not to be too mean, is camp followers. So that would be men and women, children, uh, Wives sometimes uh, served as seamstresses and laundresses, cooks, and so on. Uh, during the Civil War, um, the uh, Confederate forces had slaves, and so on. And it's been like that with the Persians, the Romans, the Greeks, and so on. But during the Mexican War, is unique. It's uh, about 40 or 50 women and children went along. Bit by bit, they were um, sent to Pueblo, Colorado, and wintered there. There were four or five women that made it all the way to uh, California. About 22 people died crossing the 1900 miles, which in my opinion is not the longest march in military history. But if you've covered that terrain, if you've been along from Council Bluffs, Iowa, the Fort Limworth, Kansas, all the way to Santa Fe, then down along the Rio Grande, over the Guadalupe Mountains into where uh, Fort Huachuca is today, and then almost to where um, you hit the Gila River and you go west. It is some very, very difficult and forbidding terrain. Now, there was always a conflict during the entire time of the service of the battalion. The who's in charge? Is it the military leaders under authority of the President of the United States holding commissions or was it the church leaders? There was 170, Levi Hancock, who was a general authority, and then uh, David Pettigrew and others who felt very strongly about the church aspect, which because they were all brethren more or less and so on. So there was always that conflict that went on, but overall, the battalion was very loyal, very diligent, making that march as they did uh, is an incredible feat. And one of the Historians, I'd like to quote, uh, Jack Bauer wrote a wonderful book on the Mexican War in the uh, 1970s. He wrote, while the dispassionate historian may eschew such verbal fireworks, the Mormon march was clearly one of the most notable accomplishments of a war in which American soldiers made some military, uh, some of military history's most illustrious marches. Cook's accomplishments ranks with those of Kearney, Donovan, Wool. So the battalion was never in combat. There was almost a fight with a uh, perdicio um, company of about uh, 100 uh, Mexican soldiers in uh, Tucson, but that did not develop into come into an actual battle. Uh, they weren't perfectly trained, but once they got to California, they helped General Kearney solve a political issue that he was having a fight professionally with John C. Fremont, who was going to be the governor, the military governor of, of uh, California. With the battalion there to support um, Kearney under Lieutenant Colonel Philip St. George Cook, another West Point graduate, that was one of their great and significant contributions to the occupation time in California. I will tell you, as a military historian in closing, there is no battalion in our army, in our past, that is more memorialized, honored, and told about 
any other unit. I mean, we have the 82nd Airborne and the, all these different units that have served, you know, the, some of the Marine units, it's just amazing. But there's a visitor center at each end of the trail. There's hundreds of plaques and monuments along the trail. Even in Utah, where the battalion, um, the state of Utah today, never stepped foot in, um, there's, this is the place monument, other things everywhere. It's, um, there's all kinds of memorabilia all along the trail. It's just amazing the amount of memorialization for a unit. And just because they didn't fight, that doesn't mean that they um, didn't serve honorably and so on. So uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to uh, share these uh, points and thoughts with you today. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Sherman Fleek for sharing history that contributes to our understandings of the complexities of this Utah, of Utah's history and sparks new questions for us to consider. Our next presenter is Dr. Armando Solorzano. Dr. Armando Solorzano received a doctoral degree in sociology at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He is currently a professor and researcher at the University of Utah. In 2004, he received the Utah Governor's Award in the Humanities. In 2008, a Latino newspaper in Utah recognized him as one of the most prominent Latino thinkers and activists in the state. The same year, City Weekly granted Dr. Solorzano the award of the best political art exhibit to honor his photographic exhibit on the lives of Latino immigrants in the United States. This photographic exhibit documented the 2006 Dignity March in support of non-authorized workers in the state of Utah. Dr. Solorzano has published several books, among them, We Remember, We Celebrate, We Believe, Latinos in Utah, University of Utah Press. In 2015, he received the Utah Division of State's Meritorious Book Award. His most recent book, the Day of the Dead in Zapotlan was published by the University of Guadalajara Press in 2018. He is currently working on two more books. One addresses the history of immigration in Utah and the Dignity March, and the second one traces the contributions of Chicanas and Latinas to the Beehive State. Welcome, Dr. Solorzano. Leticia, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it, what you say sounds like a eulogy. You don't leave anything for my funeral. I don't know what they're going to say when I die. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the, the invitation for this dialogue, for this opportunity to share our story and our perspectives on, on the state of Utah. What I'm going to do, uh, let me see if I can, hopefully I'll be able to share my screen. Um, it's right here. Yeah, so everybody should have uh, the screen of my presentation. And this is what I'm planning to do. Hopefully I will have uh, enough time to do it. I'm trying to put together time, people, geography. And with, again, the whole objective is for us to come together, understand our different perspective and our positionality. I, again, when we say Utah, Mexico, there are very complex uh, nations and territories. So I will put it, try to put it together and I'll start talking about when Utah was indigenous territory, which has, which has a, a, a very strong implication for us. Then I will move to talk about when Utah was Spain. And after that, I will try to talk a little bit about the complexities when Utah was Mexico. And then I will end it up um, making the point that Utah is still indigenous, is still Hispanic, is still Mexican, is Chicanos, is Latinos, and everybody loves. So with that in mind, let's start um, this presentation. So when Utah was in ind indigenous territory, if you look at the map, all these areas on your left hand, those are the language 
than we talk 5,000 years before Columbus arrived to our indigenous continent. That was the language of the Utah Aztecan language that linked the Utes, the Aztec, the Soshones, the Paiutes, the Hopis, and even people in South America. So linguistically, we are together. We, there are words in that the Utes speak, that the Aztecs also spoke, that today we also speak in Mexico. So this linkage, these connections among our people, it crises five, 5,000 years ago. And I know some of you can say, well, how far we need to go back? And my only answer to that is, we are a soul as our memories. And my memory, can I reach only up to 5,000 years? Hopefully, this will bring us an understanding of this history. So we do have here, even when Utah was in the United you know, territory, on the right, I'm sorry, on your left side, in the center of this circle is Venus. Venus is, um, is a pictograph that you can visit and locate in Sego Canyon, which, is, which you can find in Thompson, Utah. Hopefully the people from that area of the state are listening to us. What is fascinating about this is that Venus, that is in one of the caves right there in Thompson, Utah, appear also in the first circle of the Mexican, the Aztec calendar, that it was finished in 1479. So this tells us in the story um, based on the situation that the youths and the Aztecs at the beginning were together. So they separated and one group of the youths start walking all the way south until they found Tenochtitlan, which is now we know as Mexico. So you can see, again, that the beginning of the Aztec civilization we found here in the ter territory of Utah, and that keep us connected. So then we talk what uh, two people have always referred to, to the Dominguez Escalante expedition in 1776. Again, this is another beginning. And you can, uh, if you follow me, you can see different beginnings where every group is trying to, uh, to contain, trying to establish the power. So in the Dominguez Escalante expedition, you can see in the map how the expedition went all the way out to Utah. Important for the history of the Mexican, um, people, the Mexican Americans and the Chicanos, is that when we hear about the expedition, and as you can saw in the wonderful picture that uh, Artes de Mexico present us, the, the prominent figure are the friars, Dominguez and Escalante, right? But for us, what is important is that they hardly did anything because the Mexican Indians that traveled with them they were their interpreters, they keep their horses and mules. We don't hear about them, but we know their names, and I know they are in the diary of Dominguez Escalante. So to us, this is, again, a new way of phrasing and presenting uh, Utah history. So the influence of these Mexican Indians was perceived in the names they were given to the place the expedition was uh, getting to. And if you look at on the left side of your screen, you can see the names that the Mexican Indians and the uh, expeditioners were putting on those places. What is it there to notice? That the majority of the names that were related to names in the Catholic tradition the Valle de la Purissima, right? The Valle de Nuestra Señora de la Merced, which is the patron of the Franciscans, right? And then you continue, Rio de San Antonio. I don't wanna, again, uh, emphasize 
too much here because I want to move the presentation and do it in 20 minutes. Then you have the Sissimo Nombre de Jesus, yeah? the sacred sweet name of Jesus. What happened is that after the arrival of the pioneers to Utah, they started changing names. So the whole geography looks different. It's not the same to go to Rio de San Antonio than to read a place like Moab, Nehi, right? Nephi. So this completely changed the geography in the state of Utah. And this is important because this, what is called Utah exceptionalism, this doesn't, did not happen in the other state, like in Arizona, New Mexico, California. The most important part of California, San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Antonio, no? I still maintain the name. This is important to the Mexican, Mexican traditions and Chicanos, because we know that without land, there is no culture. If we don't feel that association with the land, with the mountains, with the massage, massage front, then our culture is gone, right? Because the land is gone. So without culture, there is no identity. And with identity, there is no people. And that's why, again, through the history of Utah, we have been invisible. Even if we have been there, it's not that we don't have history. It's that people don't take the time to look at all contributions. Then again, I'm making very big jumps just to concentrate the issue on the relationship between Utah and Mexico. So in the, in, um, the independence that um, Mr. Consul Borjón already talked about it in, of Mexico in 1810. What happened here is that some criollos, Mexica, and Indians got together and got rid of the Spaniards, and they claim uh, the independence, Mexico as an independent country. So as you can see here on the right, or in this orange color, all the possessions that Spain has conquered an explorer, they are not anymore the property of Spain. Now they are the property of Mexico. Spain territories became Mexican territories. And in that same, uh, in the, in that same route, we see what happened in 1847. The LDS pioneer traspassed Mexican territory without permission of the Mexican government. And as the, in the previous uh, picture or painting that it was shown on the image of this angel of manifest destiny, this is one of the most known pictures in the American culture. This is when they entered Mexican territory in 1947. Why did they do it? Listen, I can give you seven interpretations. The, the most prominent one is that they entered the Great Basin running away from religious persecution in, in Nauvoo, Illinois. It's what uh, Mr. Flick already mentioned it to us, right? That it was the only group, the only army that was based on religious purposes. So they entered, they trespassed Mexican territory. So the, one of the theories said that they were looking to come to Mexico because they want to establish themselves in Mexico because the persecution was very cruel. The Mormons were experiencing the death of the leaders of Joseph Smith. They, uh, they were destroying the property. So they want to live in a more peaceful country. And where is that? They thought that they will come to Mexico. They will be able to establish themselves, right? And at the same time, establish the, again, the kingdom of Zion. When they were thinking about that, guess what? 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And why is this important? Because now if they were thinking to establish their kingdom in Mexico. Now they find themselves again in the United States. So this Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo 
ended the Mexican-American War of 1846 and 1848. Again, why the war happened? There are many interpretations, depends whose book do you read. The fact for us is that the United States annexed 50% of the Mexican territory. And those are the states that Dr. Alvarez already mentioned, Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, and Wyoming. 50% of our territory uh, came to the United States. What the United States offered as a, as a sign of peace, $1.5 million for the half of the enchilada that we, that we say in Mexico, right? And there is a still very strong conversations whether the United States pay for this amount. So that is probably one of the questions that we need to look at uh, and resolve, not tonight, is gonna take us years and years of research. So the land that Mexico gave up at that time was called Mexican Session. And today is what we know the whole Southwest. So what was the reaction of Brigham Young and this relationship of wanted to be in Mexico, but now in the United States? Because he was the leader. So Brigham Young was aware that the Mexican government was not hospitable to the immig immigrants in the far northern frontier. What does that mean? That Reagan Young thought that they were immigrants. This war is fundamental because they recognized that in 1947, they might be getting some response from the Mexican government. Okay? Why did they know that they, they were immigrants? Because Brigham Young know that also there were a group of French who were trying also to take over the territory of Utah. Of course, they were tri trappers and they had other locations, but they asked permission to the Mexican government. And the Mexican government answered them by saying, yes, you can trap in our territory only if you become Mexican. So a lot of French sailors as said Mexican nationality before entering the territory. So after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Brigham Young made the claim that the, the territory did not belong to Mexico. It belongs to the Indian. Well, what does it mean? Well, three years later, 1851, Mr. Young appointed himself as superintendent of Indian affairs to the federal government, meaning that he became the representative of the Indians. Remember, before he claimed this land is not Mexican, never belonged to Mexico, right? <laughs> but belonged to the Indians. So in this reconfiguration of the land, Nate Abraham and John said, if the land belongs to the Indians, then guess what? I am the representative in Washington. In the same year, so we have the Abraham and John, was the leader of the Mormon church, was the government governor of Utah territory, and be, uh, added to that was the representative of the Indians in Washington, very three powerful position. So in regard to uh, the Mexicans who were living in Utah territory, because remember they, 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 they were so, uh, so Brigham uh, John stated, and I don't know if I will be able because my, is in the way, oh, right there. He stated, all Mexican now in the territory are, remember, they are already, what he considered to be the United States, they are required to remain quiet in this settlement and not attempt to live under any consideration until further, further our, our advice. So that was the situation of Ring and John in relationship to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo into the situations of the Mexican living in the state. So if we go, again, this is obviously, you can see is the uh, Utah flag. For us, for Mexicans, for Latinos, Chicano, Latinos, it's very important. Look at those two dates, 1847. 1847 is, to me, is the recognition that the LDS pioneer recognized 
that this is Mexican territory because the treaty only came in 1848. And in fact, if you go to places, cities like Taylorville to the north of Salt Lake, at the entrance of the city, there is a large plaque and it said this city was created in 1847. To me, it was built in Mexican territory, right? Given the date. And of course, the second date is 1896. Okay. This is important to keep in mind. Why? Because last Monday in the Capitol, uh, the legislators proposed to change the flag of Utah. Please be attentive to this detail. If they are going to do it, I want to be invited to this remodeling of the flag of Utah. I want you to be invited. And together, if they have in mind another flag, let's put that flag together. So when that, after that time, this is what the Mexican-Americans or New Mexicanos were saying about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, where I live. There has been four, four different flags. The Spanish flag for several hundred years. Then we had the French flag, the Mexican flag, and then the American flag. It is kind of interesting to be part of this area. And this photography, it might be the oldest photography of Mexicans and new Mexicans, new Mexicanos families in the state of Utah. So for them, it was kind of, we have been invaded so many times, but guess what? It's still our land. This is the land of our ancestors. So that was the, the, the reaction at that particular time. Then again, I'm moving in big historical periods because what I want to do is again to portray that, that history so later on we can look at it. Something fascinating here. What are the implications of the treaty for Mexican and Mexican Americans? Well, the first <laughs> uh, Mexican consul, and Dr. Uh, Mr. Warhan, this will be interesting uh, to consider. The first Mexican consul in Utah was a Japanese. And I'm not talking about a Japanese American, but a Japanese who was living in Utah. So what happened in 1912? Mexicans were recruited to work in the mines. Why? Remember, this is almost the beginning of World War I, and we need, uh, we need the copper, the carbon. So there were not enough workers. So we are gonna bring the Mexicans here for the first time, okay? So Mr. Dayaguerre Hashimoto, Japanese labor contractor, went to Mexico to recruit the miners. So he visited the president of Mexico, Venustiano Carranza, and the president made him the first honorary Mexican consul in Utah, okay? So look at the relationship that we already established with the Japanese, one Japanese person being our first consul. What do you make out of that? Well, what are the implications? Um, if you, this book, he, uh, and the air didn't devour him, that was written by Tomás Rivera in the 70s. You know, Tomás Rivera was a migrant worker who became president of the university, I believe the University of Texas, right? He wrote this book uh, with a narrative of the migrant workers who start in California and go all the way around to Arizona. And he did a good job. But in the middle of the book, he introduced this, uh, uh, this narrative, and I'm going to read it because again, it's, to me, it's fascinating. Fascinating. He said, uh, "Comadre," meaning God, uh, the godmother. Do you all plan to go to Utah? No, compadre. I will tell you, we don't trust the man that is contracting people to work in. How do you say it? Utah. Why, comadre? Well, because we don't think there is such a state. You tell me, when have you ever heard of that place? Well, there is not so many states. And this is the first time that they are contract for work in those parts. Yeah, but tell me, where is it? Well, we have never been there, but I hear 
is somewhere close to Japan. Huh? <laughs> what did you make out of that? When I read it, uh, that was 20 years ago, I thought because the state of Utah was not very well known. But then, through studies, I understood that the migrant workers don't want to come to Utah because Mr. Hashimoto, right, which is not true, right, which is because Has Hashimoto was still contracting them. And then why didn't bring them to Japan? And said, so, no way we'll go to Utah. Isn't that fascinating, right? This, even the history of the Mexican consulate in the state of Utah. So, but it was not only 1847, 1847, there is a centrality in the immigration movement in Mexico and its relationship. If you look at here, yeah, we talk about that. 1847, the LDS entered Mexico territory without due process, okay? Then 1848, fascinating. What happened? Remember, this is when uh, Utah Territory became part of the United States. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in Chapter 3, Article 3, said the territory belonged to Utah or to the United States, but the land belongs to the Mexican. So the issue was is how we are going to be distributing, distributing the land. And another time of this relationship of crossing border, it happened in 1896. Remember the flag that we already show? It has two dates, 1896. That's what we are celebrating today and throughout this year, the 125th anniversary of the creation of this state. So in 1896, the LDS, who did not accept it, the poly polygyny conditions of the statehood, and you know, people call it polygamy, right? Those LDS uh, brothers and sisters who did not accept, they crossed the Mexican border and established their colony in Chihuahua without permission, okay? Second cross of the border. The story is not over. 1910, this is the time of the Mexican revolution that uh, Dr. Uh, Borjón already talked to us about it. Well, due to the Mexican revolution, one probably is the bloodiest revolution in our time. A large group of LDS now crossed the US border. Now is, they are going back, they're crossing, okay? And they, when they cross, now they're crossing US territory. They got it to Monticello, Moa, and Blanden, and guess what? they joined the Mexican and Hispanics that I show in the previous picture who will settle in that area and establish the industry. That is a very strong time of connection, of relationship, the council call it conciliation. Yes, this movement through borders, now you get uh, put together in, uh, through this continued crossing of borders. So I'm going to be jumping probably 40 years, and I uh, will talk about uh, socio and the Chicano civil rights movement, okay? This is probably the most fascinating story of Mexican, Mexican-American, Chicanos, and Latinos in the state. And the story is to be is still to be written, but I want to bring just into consideration this situation. The issue of Aztlán. Remember the council, and Leticia already mentioned this. Aztlán is the sacred land of the Aztec people, right? Is the land that their god and goddesses gave them to them where there is abundance of fruit, of water, of corn, a society organized under theological principles, right? Well, in the at the end of 1960s and 70s, in Utah, members of the socio and the representatives of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement brought the issue of Aztlán. Again, is what um, we have been talking about living memory. Yes, because as people, we are walking history. We are history. We are made out of history. We are made of mythologies, of historical facts. So again, the living, the, the historical consciousness of the people come to us plan, okay? This is a time 
for dialogue that never happened. If the Mexican, Mexican Americans and Chicanos in Utah were talking of Aslan, the LDS people were talking about the other mythology, right? Remember Brigham Young when he entered in 1947, this is the land. And who told you is the land? My God told me. So you have two very powerful mythologies playing at the same time. Aslan, the idea of Aslan come back. And then again, if we go to the beginning of my presentation, you, you can see, right? that we mentioned that they were the whole uh, movement of the of section of the youth that walked down for 500 years to Tenochtitlan. Well, people believe in, in during the, that time. And this is, again, I, I don't know how I'm doing about time, but if you want to cut me, uh, well, please let me know how, at least how many minutes I have. So this is what people are uh, were saying. This is an interview that I did 20 years ago. And uh, again, because I had so uh, returning to a star, Luis Barraza, uh, I think he, he's still alive. He said, some Latinos are returning to Zion. Meaning that for us, well, for members of the, some Latinos and Mexicans, Mexican Americans or Hispanics of the LDF religion, they are returning to Zion. You see the change? There are no saying we are returning to Aslan. They are looking to Zion as the mythology. And so you get an interesting return where they are from Mexico, from Colombia, Nicaragua. And so you get a certain numbers of literary saints, Mormons, who are saying, and this is the Latinos, I'm coming back. See, for us, there is not immigration. There is just a continual go in and out, back and forward to Orlando. We are not immigrants. Well, they continue saying, I'm coming back. This is where I wanted to be. I want to be close to the center of my religion. If you are Catholic, you want to be close to Rome, to be close to the Vatican and, and the Pope. If you are Muslim, you want to be close to Mecca. And so it is with Mormons. They want to be close to the seat of the religious center. That's how we start explaining immigration in Utah in the 1960s. Again, immigration was a religious phenomenon. But not everybody interpreted that way. Some of the people, okay, Juan Valderas, um, he said, I'm returning, remember this movement back and forth, I'm returning to what you might call the mother faith, to Aztlán. So this is a different interpretation of borders and immigration, right? And mythologies. Aztlán is the place of our ancestors, our sacred land. Um, so I'm just gonna give it two more. Uh, how this was translated into uh, our present life. A first for Utah, and make the first Mexican president who came to the state, it was Vicente Fox in the year 2008. So he came to talk about the export of cement to Utah for the reconstruction of I-15. Do, don't quote me on this because I need to find the sources. But I do believe that 80% of the cement that we use to reveal I-15 came from Mexico. So you might be driving on the Mexican highway, right? So what they else talk about when President Fox came to Utah, NAFTA. They want, uh, the, we need the avocados, right? But we also need electronic components because the development of the computer industry. Fascinating for those of you who think that there are adversarial relationships. They also talk, and they did it, about President Fox or the Mexican government sending textbooks for Mexican and Mexican-American children in elementary school. Fascinating, right? Because th there is this also uh, alliances in terms of culture and cooperation. Uh, they talk about the agreement of work permits for agricultural workers, okay? I'm gonna bring, uh, go over that one and see how that visit was interpreted by the media. And here it is, okay? The Washington Times, Fox News, and Patrick Buchanan, in this book and the cover you have on your left side, they framed the visit of President Fox 
as an attempt of Mexicans to invade the United States. They said they are coming back to conquer us. Remember the whole issue of Aztlán. This is a full a misinterpretation, but again, probably is what uh, Professor Leticia was saying, is a different angle. So the arguments were based on Mexican immigration, right? The Mexican-American resistance to assimilation, right? And that is reflected in English all languages and the mythical, mythical homeland of Aztlán. And this is a quote from the book, the Aztlán tour involved Utah, Washington, and California, part of the mythical indigenous homeland. That's what, according to them, President Fox came to do. Uh, I'm gonna jump on that because, again, they talk about this plan. So what we are doing here is reconquer the Southwest or the return to Aztlán, okay? They use the mythology of the Mexican, Mexican-American people in transforming it into a complot and algorithm and something that doesn't allow us to come into dialogue. I wanna close, no, this is, I do, do I have three more minutes? I hope, okay, three more minutes. Uh, what was the implication of these books in this interpretation? Well, that came uh, through um, the Dignity March in Utah. And I'm pulling this. Uh, to me, this is a wonderful representative, representative picture of Mexican and Mexican-Americans. Look at that. So they said in that a march, we are not immigrants. When people tell us Mexicans go home, we don't have any place to go. Utah is home. This is the land of our ancestors. We were here before the pioneers entered the Southwest, and we are going to remain here, mainly because our families are American families. And this is our country. And we want our children to grow up with a sense of respect and reverence for Utah. Is not that what we all are looking for? And I'm gonna finish with this. Uh, in this spirit of reconciliation, dialogue, coming together as people, going beyond the paradigms, the theories that we have to interpret our history, provide this letter. Uh, it was in the speech that Chief Seattle replied to the government when the government in 1854, this is quite six years, right? After the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, because now the government wants to buy the land. And this, le this letter, I think, reflects the spirit of the Latino, Chicanx, Latino people. This is, again, please, for those of you who are, this is an edit, an adaptation that I did. It's not, I mean, the letter is too long. I just want to make it short. But this is the message. White chief, meaning president of the United States, white chief sent us word that we wish, that he wishes to buy your land. We will ponder your proposition and we decide we will let you know, okay? But if we don't accept it, you will take it anyway. So you might know that the mother land is not for sale. Every part of the soil is sacred in the estimation of my people every hillside, every valley, every plain and grove, every rock which seem to be dumb and dead are connected with the lives of my people. And when the last red man shall have perished and the memory of my tribe shall have become a myth among the white men, these shores will song with the invisible dead of my tribe. And when you children, children think they sell alone in the field, they will not be alone. It matters little whether we pass the remnant of our days together. There will not be many, again, because with the destruction of the environment. Tribe follows tribe, the nation follows nations like the waves of the sea. It is the order of nature. Your time of decay may be the instant, but it will surely will come. For even the white men cannot be exempt for this common destiny. We might be brothers after all. We will see. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Solorzano. I appreciate um, 
you sharing and highlighting the complexities of the history of the various indigenous linkages of Mexicans in Utah and highlighting other historical complexities. Last of all, we're honored to have Mentes Activas joining us. Uh, sorry. Um, Mentes Activas joining us. Mentes Activas is a nonprofit organization of Latino community educators specializing in dementia caused by Alzheimer's disease. Its main objective is to know the symptoms of the disease and delay its development. They build productive and lasting relationships to have positive impacts through all their activities. Tenemos a tres representantes de Mentes Activas que van a compartir sus poemas. We have three representatives of Mentes Activas who will be sharing their poems. Primero tenemos a Ángeles Conejo. First, we have Ángeles Conejo. Ángeles es de Irapuato, Guanajuato, México. Estudia, estudió la carrera de enfermería en su ciudad natal. Llegó a Utah con sus tres pequeños hijos en octubre del año 2000. Actualmente trabaja como asistente de enfermería en un asilo. Le gusta disfrutar de la naturaleza, del tiempo con su familia y amistades. Escuchar música, leer un buen libro, escribir un poco para sacudir los sentimientos y le gusta aprender algo nuevo cada día. Ángeles is from Irapuato, Guanajuato, Mexico. She studied nursing in her hometown. She came to Utah with her three young children in October of 2000. She currently works as a nursing assistant in a nursing home. She likes to enjoy nature with her family and friends, listen to music, read a good book, write a little to shake up feelings, and she likes to learn something new every day. Bienvenida, Ángeles. Te invito para que leas tu poema. Gracias. Buenas tardes a todos. Y gracias por la oportunidad que me dan de estar aquí, aquí representando Mentes Activas. Uh, mi poema se llama Encajar. Buscando encajar en una sociedad tan inhumana, guardé mis deseos y sufrimientos. Moldeé mis sueños para que se parecieran a los suyos y me aceptaran como parte del rebaño. No fue difícil, ya lo había aprendido. En mi propio hogar se incubaba también ese rechazo. Normas y leyes que impusieron hace cientos de años para hacer más fácil la convivencia. Olvidaron escribir con letras grandes, respeto como base de sus razonamientos. He conocido gente apuntando con su dedo al prójimo y en su casa lo que juzgan se les acumula y se les vuelve pestilente. Y es que todo el mundo tiende a hacer juicios de lo que sus ojos ven. Lástima que sus ojos no vean para adentro. No importa el lugar en donde estás o de dónde vienes, siempre habrá gente con un pero. El color, sexo, edad, la lengua o el dinero. Aunque muchas veces el pero es el número en la etiqueta de tu ropa o el número en la báscula, tu altura, tu maquillaje o tu peinado. Te juzgan por tu edad, por lo que has o no has logrado. ¿Por qué simplemente no se enfocan en cambiar en ellos lo que les molesta en otros? Sería mejor la humanidad si antes de amar al prójimo de esa manera, se amaran a sí mismos cuando se miran al espejo. Y en lugar de querer que el otro encaje en sus ideales, nos aceptemos simplemente como hermanos. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias por compartir tu poema. A continuación, tenemos y finalmente nos acompaña Berta Fernández. Finally, we are accompanied by Berta Fernández. Berta Fernández es originaria de Guerrero, México. Llegó a Utah en el año 1998. Trabaja limpiando casas y en sus ratos libres le gusta leer, escribir, salir a caminar y bailar. Es madre de cuatro hijos de edad 20, 17, 15 y 13. Berta Fernández is originally from Guerrero, Mexico. She came to Utah in 1998. She works cleaning homes and in her spare time, she likes to read, write, go for walks and dance. She is a mother of four children ages 20, 17, 15 and 13. Bienvenida, Ángeles. Te invito para que leas tu po poema.
Gracias, Berta. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Berta Fernández y yo les voy a compartir un poema de Juan de Dios Pesa. Mi padre, mi padre, yo tengo en el hogar un soberano único a quien venera el alma mía en su corona de cabello cano. La honra es su ley y la virtud su guía. En lentas horas de miseria y duelo, lleno de firme y varonil constancia, guarda la fe con que me habló del cielo en las horas primeras de mi infancia. La amarga prescripción y la tristeza en su alma abrieron incurable herida. Es un anciano y lleva en su cabeza el polvo del camino de la vida. Ve del mundo las fieras tempestades de la suerte, las horas desgraciadas y pasa como Cristo el Tiberiades de pie sobre las horas encrespadas. Seca su llanto, calla sus dolores y solo en el deber sus ojos fijos recoge espinas y derrama flores sobre la senda que trazó a sus hijos. Me ha dicho, a quien es bueno, la amargura jamás en llanto sus mejillas moja. En el mundo, la flor de la aventura, el más ligero soplo, se deshoja. Hace el bien sin temer el sacrificio, el hombre ha de luchar sereno y fuerte y haya quien odia la maldad y el vicio, un tálamo de rosas en la muerte. Si eres pobre, confórmate y sé bueno. Si eres rico, protege al desgraciado y lo mismo en tu hogar. Que en el, aje, el ajeno guarda tu honor para vivir honrada, honrado. Ama la libertad, libre es el hombre y su juez más severo es la conciencia. Tanto como tu honor guarda tu hombre, tu nombre, pues mi nombre y mi honor forman tu herencia. Este código Augusto es mi alma. Pudo desde que lo escuché quedar grabado en todas las tormentas, fue mi escudo de todas las borrascas, me ha salvado. Mi padre tiene en su mirar sereno reflejo, fiel de su conciencia honrada. Cuánto consejo cariñoso y bueno, sorprende en el fulgor de su mirada. La nobleza del alma es su nobleza, la gloria del deber forma su gloria. Es pobre pero encierra su pobreza la página más grande de su historia. Siendo el culto de mi alma su cariño, la suerte quiso que al, honra, al honrar su nombre fuera el amor que me inspiró de niño, lo más sagrada inspiración del hombre. Quisiera el cielo que el canto que inspira siempre sus ojos con amor lo vean y de todos los versos de mi lira estos dignos de su nombre sean. Gracias.